You are listening to Faithless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Rogue. Each week we design new decks for tournament play. We put our creations to the test and share our findings on the air. Coming up on the brew session, Hari Jin pairs cost reduction with a body that's made to rumble. But can it grant our wishes in Pioneer? Then on the flashback, testing results with Soul of Windgrace and Tolarian Terror. That's all coming up on Faithless Brewing. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show! Faithless Brewing. I am David Robertson coming to you from the Twin Cities, and I am joined as always by the CEO of the Faithless Brewing Podcast. He's not in America anymore. Does he still love America? We will find out. He is Cave Dan Online. He is Daniel Schriever. What is going on? <laughs> I'm doing great, David. Actually, that's not true. I'm not doing great. I'm getting my ass kicked this week. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been complaining right before we started recording about like, ah, this week's been terrible. I have COVID this week. And at the same time, I erect my foot. So like, I can't even walk. I have family visiting as well. So like we had to redo this whole elaborate sightseeing itinerary. It was supposed to happen. And instead I've just been completely bedridden the whole time. This is what happens when you leave America. They just, they sabotage your dreams and hopes. <laughs> So the good news is that before I came to Jerusalem, I was able to get the bivalent booster. So recovery has gone well. Get your booster shots. They help a lot. But damn. Yeah, especially with winter coming. Yeah. For people who live in the colder climes. All right, so we want to give a quick reminder to everybody. We are going to talk about our newest card of brew round. That is the Haughty Gin. We're going to talk about some of our findings. I got back in stateside and got to try a couple of leagues. Um, we want to give a quick shout out that if you enjoy the podcast and would like to support us, the best way to do that is to go to patreon.com slash faithless brewing, become a patron at whatever level is comfortable to you. You get to support the show, you get discord access, etc. cetera. Uh, so yeah, just at the top of the show, we appreciate anybody who contributes. We, we really do appreciate it. It's the kind of thing that keeps us going. Yeah. The discord is full of all kinds of crazy ideas and, uh, with spoiler season coming, if you want to get on this new tech early, it's always somebody saying, you know, is this card good? And of course, then we all say no, and it turns out to be awesome. And then we, you know, <laughs> all right, <laughs> maybe I should have bought four of these when they were, you know, 50 cents. <laughs> yeah. What was our latest, our latest advice was to buy Orvar the All Form, right? I think that's fair advice. Earlier, I said to buy Soul of Windgrace. I'm not sure if that advice is going to hold up or not, but it has increased in price. Okay, well then. You can reap your profits right now by selling <laughs> if you aren't a long-term believer. <laughs> oh, here's a new finance tip. I forgot to mention this in Monday's show, but yeah, there's something called the Magic 30th Countdown Edition Secret Layer. It's basically an advent calendar. 30 cards individually wrapped, so you can open one every day of the month in December. The cards in this set are amazing cards, like Old Border Chrome Mox Alternate Art which is like a $100 card by itself. And then you also get 29 other cards, like Necropotence, Shark Typhoon, an amazing Elspeth with art by Rebecca Gay. This is going to be a banger set. The first secret layer where I actually thought like, wow, I actually, I want that. That looks amazing. And the kicker is like this for the first time, they're like limited quantities only. Unlike all other secret layers, it's not print to demand. So it'll sell out like in an hour by speculators, I'm sure. But if that all sounds good to you, just bookmark a calendar. I think November 1st is when it will go on sale. That's a good tip. Or if you have a, maybe a magic player in your life, this sounds like an excellent Christmas present for a partner or a child or... I'll buy one for you too. Yeah. Buy two well, yeah, of for course. yourself. <laughs> one for them, one for you. You know, the old... <laughs> one for you and one for your college fund because daddy's going to put it away in your there it is. sealed Investing magic Investing in the uh, old border chrome mocks. That's a, 
Exactly. Hey, the way the stock market's going right now, that's where I'd have my money. <laughs> Hot tips like this, you can only find them in yeah. the Discord in here. Love it. All right, let's get down to brass tacks here. It's brew session time. I'm back. Oh, yes. Haughty Gin. Love this card. Talk to me. Haughty Gin, one blue blue creature Gin. Star four flying. Haughty Gin's power is equal to the number of instant and sorcery cards in your graveyard. Instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast. So you're getting a flyer with pretty big butts. Potentially a lot of power, right? Think of Enigma Drake, right? This is the exact same setup there. But in addition to Enigma Drake's impressive attacking abilities, you also get this cost reduction effect. So Enigma Drake is the same card as this, but it is it colors. And, you, you know, we understood that you had to put a lot of spells in your deck, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here, the same principle, but now you're getting this bonus payoff for having all the spells in your deck. You're getting the ability to churn through those spells super fast. In terms of details, there really isn't much to say about it. Star power is defined in every zone. Haughty Jin only counts the cards in your graveyard, so this is not like Crackling Drake. This is just like Enigma Drake. You, you will get wrecked by Go Blanks, Unlicensed Hurst, etc. Overall, I think it's pretty straightforward in terms of like what the card does and is asking you to do. Yes, I agree, I agree with that. So... The first question, at least that comes to my mind, is like, is this possibly any good? Like, it's three mana, it does not have an ETB. <laughs> the floor seems really low, right? Is that fair to say? Like, if I spend my turn casting the Haughty Jin and I don't get to untap with it, I've probably had a pretty bad turn. Yeah, I mean, I will talk about it from Pioneer. We are now seeing Shieldred seeing play, which is a four mana card without a come into play ability. And that's mm. seeing much more play than I would have guessed. Uh, I, I was, you know, quite, quite off about the card. I still am not like super impressed by it, but it's, it's playable at least. This is one mana cheaper and itself lets you play five mana worth of cards on turn four, um, which is the relevant turn in my opinion. So you're saying that this is a turn four play so that you immediately take advantage of the cost reduction. That's my goal. So the first deck I'm going to talk about plays this and Crackling Drake. So that means your turn four is always one of those cards, if you think about it that way. You either play Crackling Drake on four, where you get your card back right away, and they have to kill it probably, right? Crackling Drake's going to have four or five power, even if they, they've they got their active uh, artifact and they've you know discard two and all this stuff. This is a threat they have to answer. It's much more powerful than any four drop in any other mid-range list. And or this with Counterspell or some type of additional effect up. That's, that's, the, that's the plan. Okay. Before we get to the list, let me just throw a couple big picture questions at you. First up, the cost reduction, right? This is the new part of the card, the part that is not just Enigma Drake. Is that the big draw or is that just a bonus? How much am I tailoring my deck, my selection of spells around maximizing that? how many spells do I need to have in my deck that will actually get paid off by having Haughty Jin in play? Because I can't, I don't think I can count on having the Jin in play since it doesn't protect itself. No, exactly. I think you don't want to make a deck, you know, like I'm going to recommend always playing like Consider, right? So mm. I think there were, for a brief time in Standard, right? You had the, uh, an, an X4, uh, Drake that didn't draw a card, right? It was just one red blue with this text. And you also had a Goblin Electromancer, a card you reference as a two mana cost reducer. And they were both in the same deck. And this is the, those cards like melded together, right? Um, so I think you want to have some spells. Uh, I think the main thing this lets you do is have some reliance on the graveyard without having to play Treasure Cruise. So you're not actually um, totally boned by someone attacking your graveyard. Uh, you, you still get to do things, and it still is a threat that they have to answer. So yeah, I'd, I'd probably play like eight spells at least that are reduced, even Treasure Cruise itself, if you want to play them together. Uh, this causes you to exile one less spell. Like Treasure Cruise, Dig Through Time, these are cards that have big, you know... <laughs> colorless requirements next to the uh the blue pips okay so if i'm doing this right now inviting my opponent to just cast go blink i dare you to to go blink me let's say they do it 
let's say they're, they're courageous. They're not scared. <laughs> they just slam the go blank and my haughty gin is wiped out, back to zero power. Nothing in my graveyard. My treasure cruise costs seven again. Am I going to get enough from just the cost reduction on this gin, or do I need to actually have it be a, like a powerful attacker? Well, I think hopefully the cost reduction is helping you rebuild. And I think the fact that they did this and they didn't actually kill your creature, we don't think of go blank as a good way to get rid of um, Tarmogoyf, right? You don't play like graveyard, I mean, rest in peace is a card, but that's not how we fought for Tarmogoyfs, right? If you don't have a lot of other graveyard synergy in your entire deck, mm. do, you, do you bring in for um, rest in peace against Jund? Sometimes I bring in one, but you can't risk drawing two. One, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it still has some weakness to that. That's why I like pairing it with other cards that don't rely on the graveyard at all. Crackling Drake, right, doesn't mind if they're exiling their graveyard. Now they've spent a lot of energy to do that, a three-mana sorcery, and, and Crackling Drake is, you know, a 7-4 that also drew a card. And maybe the key thing in what you said is the Haughty Gym will help you rebuild. And if I'm thinking along those lines... That means rebuilding. I want to have a lot of cards in my deck that just draw more cards. And Haughty Jin really, really helps you with that. Like, card draw can feed on itself, right? You can really get a lot of momentum going if you have, like, that first spell to get you started. At a certain point, you'll just be gated by mana, and, and Haughty Jin will really unlock you in that scenario. Yeah, that's the hope, right? No one's really playing this card, so have they tried it and not liked it? What we've seen is people are really reticent to try new cards, and so I'm, I'm hoping we find something here that's a little intriguing. All right, second big picture question. Haughty Jin tells me to play a lot of instants and sorceries, but I, I do need to kill the opponent. The Jin is suggesting that it can do that for me, but I'm guessing I'll need other creatures. So roughly how many creatures should we be looking at here? Are we thinking like just the Jins? Or are we thinking like... No, I, I'm thinking at least 12 creatures in every deck. I'm always pairing it with Ledger Shredder. I think those two cards work very well together. Okay. Ledger Shredder helps loot away cards that don't matter. It also um, is another flyer. We're going to play cards where flying matters. Lofty Denial and Winged Words are cards that I highlighted when Jin was spoiled. I think in the spoiler I mentioned them. Uh, they work very well with that. They don't work as well with Ledger Shredder, but they still work great, right? Ledger Shredder on turn four with Lofty Denial up is an awesome play. Um, Winged Words is, if it's a two-mana draw two, that's fine. We have to play a bunch of flying creatures, though, to make sure that they're, that's turned on. So I'd play at least 12. Yeah, I think that's a good place to start. Um, you don't want to play too many because then you're not going to be getting benefits off the cost reduction. And also your, your Haughty Jin just won't be that big, right? If you're not playing, let's say we all have to, have to have four considers. That's a must. Do you also want ops? Probably. Probably want ops. Yeah, I, I do. I, I'm, I'm recommending them, especially with Ledger Shredder, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the cantrips with Ledger Shredder allow you to super cantrip. I also like playing MDFCs because they are extra spells for Haughty Jin. They're extra spells if you're playing Crackling Drake. And they give plus one, plus one counters to Ledger Shredder. So Kazul's Fury in a red list, you know, if you only have one turn where Haughty Jin is powerful or Crackling Drake, um, Spike Field Hazard, you know, th those are cards you should at least be considering. All right. So as I'm going to put the, the list together here, I mean, are there any spectacular synergies that I should be looking for? Like, what's the ceiling on this card? My dream is on turn four, I play Haughty Jin and I have Winged Words and Lofty Denial in my hand, right? If it's a deck that can't easily kill it, I cast Winged Words. That's one blue mana draw two with Jin in play that is totally resistant to any graveyard hate that they might have. And then Lofty Denial is a one mana super mana leak if I have Haughty Jin in play. So against a deck like Mono Green or something, right? We kill their elf, we trade a few resources. On turn four, I play Haughty Jin. I counter their four or five mana Planeswalker, and I've got a four or five power flyer in play. And that's just the recipe to, to a tempo win. Yeah, I think those are some really cute synergies. I mean, Winged Words, I don't know when the last time I've seen anyone cast that. It's a high variance card, right? If you don't have a flyer in play, it's just three mana, which hurts. But if you have the Jin for one? I think the thing with winged words is that it's not horrific like three mana draw two is bad we'd never play it but it's not catastrophic if we're in a top deck war and then two mana draw two they never would just print and if, so if you're playing enough flyers that's just a reasonable card 
So other things I would look for are, I would look for any card that is two spells in one. So anything with flashback, lesson learn, right? I think divide by zero would be an interesting card to pair with Haughty Jin. Yeah, that's an interesting card. You'll get the cost reduction on both halves, right? So you're really getting a lot out of the Jin. Same with, um, I don't know, anything with like a kicker or a kicker-like claws on it. Any spell that can be expensive, you know, the MDFC, as you mentioned, because it was Fury. Yeah, I could see that being, you know, one of, one of the future cards. It becomes a lot more attractive when it only costs two. Ditto for the Salundi Vision. One little rabbit hole I'm not sure if it's worth going down is if I'm expecting to have Haughty Jin in play, right? If I want to actually have cards that cost like one and a blue so that they can get that 50% reduction, right? If you just go through the Pioneer playables, you will find like a fair number of cards at that mana cost. Impulse, Strategic Planning, Chart of Course, See the Truth if you want to get like a little weird with it. Petty Theft, right? And Stomp. Like these, these are all cards that just happen to cost that. They would get a big cost reduction from the Haughty Jin. Fires of Victory, kind of a surprising card that it doesn't look like much, but you know, it's a decent kill spell that sometimes is a two for one. So all these cards get a nice reduction from Haughty Jin. They also do work with Founding the Third Path. Founding the Third Path is also looking for that two mana spell to like get max value off chapter one. So is there like an overlap there that'd be worth exploring? The problem though, hmm, it may be. I, I don't want to say that's wrong. I think you want to play some counter magic and that's where I think Founding the Third Path is not as good. I think the real attractive card is Lofty Denial. It's a super powerful card. It's a fine card to play on turn two. With any flying creature in play, it's a fine card to play late game. I mean, costing four more is not something you can play around. It's much harder to play around the mana leak. The problem with finding the third path is the first trigger, if you already have Jin in play, is really bad because you're actually not getting to reduce your two mana spell. Um, you're playing two mana sorcery speed for it. So I think there's some kind of strange tensions there, but it's worth thinking about. It's also another non-instant spell, so it doesn't make Jin bigger, and it's not a threat to win the game. So you'd have to play around with the numbers, but maybe it's, it's an interesting point, Dan. Well, you mill on chapter two, you skip chapter one, I guess, but... Yeah, maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's how you'd use it. Maybe it's for like that See the Truth deck. Well, and you do want to play a card on turn two. So yeah, maybe, I, actually that's an interesting point. Maybe See the Truth with Haughty Jin is like sweet. Because finally the third path is best with Treasure Cruise. I think that's pretty well established by now, but that's kind of risky to go with Treasure Cruise and Haughty Jin. So maybe go back to that original See the Truth deck. Yeah, and I think that's, I think that's exactly the, the right point. Is It's amazing with Treasure Cruise, but Treasure Cruise is the card we're kind of trying to see if we can play without. Mm. Because Haughty Jin allows us to reduce our reliance on the graveyard and allows us to have these like card advantage engines that, don't, like, that aren't susceptible to uh, hearse, aren't susceptible to go blank. Right? Like, okay, you go blank me with my Jin in play. I didn't have Counterspell up. And I just like, I cast Winged Words for a blue on my next turn. And then I cast, you know, Opt or whatever. And now I have Lofty Denial up and I'm attacking you with a flyer. And you didn't, weren't actually able to disrupt my like engine type vibe of like grinding through my deck with Winged Words and, lo and Lofty Denial to counter your spells. You were able to reduce the power of my Jin. So I, I think that finding the third path is interesting, specifically with See the Truth. And so I'd want to explore that. But I think to your point, it's at its best with Treasure Cruise. And I don't think Treasure Cruise is good with Haughty Jin. And maybe the Treasure Cruise is so good you shouldn't play Haughty Jin, and that's why it's not seeing any play. That, that also could be the case. So we've been mostly naming blue spells so far, but I'm guessing that you're not proposing mono blue, right? So how do we actually assemble the deck? What do we have to fill the deck out with? Well, we need removal. That's the main thing we're splashing for. Um, and then we need additional threats. So depending on the color you're splashing, that hopefully gives you more flying creatures, because I said I want to play Wink Words, and I want to play Lofty Denial. Okay. And we're already, we already have our eight locked pieces. We have four Shredder, four Jin, And so depending on what white, green, black, or red provide to you, then that's how you can go from there. Should we start with red? Yeah, so I had had some success with a list that was playing Fable, your favorite card, along with the uh, X3 Chicky who draws a card whenever you discard. Riel the Everwise. Yeah, Riel the Everwise and uh, Ledger Shredder and Four Sensor and Crackling Drake. So I sort of built this shell off of that shell because I was still playing the eight 
cantrip. So we have four consider, four opt. We have our red removal spells, impulse and strangle. Not playing any direct damage. Imp impulse is important because it kills um, Grease Fang. Um, I have a uh, Spike Field Hazard and a Kazool's Fury. Uh, cards that are instants to discard to Shredder. Also, Kazool's Fury, very good in a deck where we we're playing. Four Haughty Jin, four Crackling Drake. So our threats are four Crackling Drake, four Haughty Jin, four Ledger Shredder, two Sprite Dragon. Um, and then four Winged Words, four Lofty Denial. I think those are the cards that you really get paid off for the most with Reduction. And then 21 Lance, you know, some number of... Uh, Odawara, so Kenzin, Hall of Storm Giants, Den of Bugbear. So most of these cards here are proven cards in the Is It Shell, but Winged Words and Lofty Denial are the ones that, you know, they stand out. I don't want to call them knuckleheads, but they're not staples. I do wonder, is Winged Words just less reliable than Charter Course? They can both draw two, assuming the Jin is in play. So is Charter Course just like a safer card? Hmm. I that's an interesting question. I think for Charter Course you'd want more cheap creatures. But maybe not. Maybe even the discard doesn't matter that much if you're playing Crackling Drake as well. Hmm. It's a fair question. I value the ability to cast winged words before combat to get the draw two to determine if I should attack or not. Because I feel like this deck's actually gonna be able to win with two attacks. And this lets me like keep back, let me know if I can keep back longer or, or less, or, or if I have to attack now. Because I think you just get into that, like the math, right? Where you're blocking, blocking with your Jin, and then mm. you're attacking once, or attacking once and furying, or playing Crackling Drake. You've got multiple blockers with like a lofty denial up, and you're threatening like one turn to kill. Because I was finding a lot with Fable that you were getting them down to like seven, eight. You just needed like that one extra attack, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I guess blocking is, is actually pretty important these days. It's very important. <laughs> you don't want to like force yourself to attack to get your two for one. Would you consider playing more copies of Kazul's Fury? There have been like, I, I won't call them Splinter Twin exactly, but Splinter Fling, Crackling Drake, Kazul's Fury decks where like that's the main way to win. You just stall, 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 eventually resolve Crackling Drake and Fury it at the opponent for like 18 damage at once yeah no i i think fury is great i i started with a split here the one mana removal spells are really important against mono green but they're not that important anywhere else i would not actually hate cutting the sprite dragons and playing like extra furies and just maybe just being a bigger deck yeah that makes sense because 12 flyers is kind of enough honestly i feel like i, I don't think 12 flyers is too few mm -hmm. last question I know that on principle we're not playing Treasure Cruise, but are you sure we shouldn't just put one or two in? Or dig through time if you prefer. Like, you have everything else. You got considers, opts, plenty of spells. Yeah, I've kicked around. You know, some of my lists have, like, one. Um, you know, you see I had one in my original list. I don't have one in this one. I, I don't know. I've, I've liked sometimes having the one. I, I'd have to play it. I just haven't played with Jin enough to know. Like, is Treasure Cruise actually just fine with Jin even in play? Like, you just cast it for six, you leave some in sor instant sorceries, it itself becomes an instant sorcery, and then the three cards you draw help you replenish. M maybe, like, one or two, or hell, maybe, like, multiple are, are totally fine. Maybe it's, like, you get, like, a bonus attack with uh, Haughty Jin, but you're actually just going to use Crackling Drake, where there it doesn't matter if you delved or not. Yeah. Distract them with the, with the Jin. Yeah, I'll have to monkey around with it. I mean, I think Sprite Dragon is like by far the weakest card here. And so that's the card I'm looking to cut. Mm -hmm. And so playing like another Kazool's Fury and, and a Treasure Cruise, that obviously is interesting to me. But without playing, I just, you know, th this is my best guess. And I, I certainly could be way wrong. All right, so that's an is it attempt at Haughty Jin. What's interesting is that you can also pair it with basically any other color, but you've got a Demure build here. I play some cards I wouldn't expect. Yeah, so one card I was super excited to play is Ebb and Death Draco Lich. I think <laughs> this card is really cool. Four mana flash, five, two flying dragon. It does come into play tapped. But uh, you need to kind of be like an aggro tempo flying list, and there hasn't really been one in blue black. This is a actually super cool deck for it. Um, the removal spells, of course, we have a couple fatal pushes just because it's so good. We have 
the eight cantrips, we have the four ledger shredders, we have the four lofty denials. Kitesail Freebooter is a flyer that's also disruptive um, that I actually really like. Wait, Kitesail Freebooter? The human's card? Yeah. It flies. <laughs> but you can't do that. <laughs> You're not allowed to play Kitesail Freebooter outside of humans. It's written on the card somewhere, I'm sure. Well, maybe. I <laughs> mean... <laughs> Yeah, you're already playing all this disruption. You have counter spells to preserve the card. It 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 is often going to be a card that you take their removal spell, um, and then it just goes the distance, right? They won't necessarily be able to kill Kaisel Freebooter because you're playing all these other uh, flying creatures. Kaisel Freebooter makes Winged Words cheaper. Mm. All right, we'll try it first. I'll reserve judgment until we've tried it. <laughs> but yeah. That's a surprise to see that one just chill in there with the rest of the creatures. Well, the problem is with black, you don't have that many good flying creatures. You can play the um, the one black black uh, four four, or you get, you can play it for three if they've taken damage. Spawn of Mayhem, but that's more aggressive, right? Yeah, so I don't like that card in lists that are playing like lofty denial type there, there isn't a good like black card so you need to have en enough flyers right you need to have on the order of 12 flyers so we've got three kite self rebooter one ebon death the appeal of black is the removal suite lets us play especially an eliminate is awesome with haughty gin and it's a fine card in general you see blue black playing at least two of these cards now so that's the thing that's really drawing us. We need to have enough flyers i think to justify the the haughty gin ledger shredder lofty denial winged words package there's got to be something else. <laughs> yeah, I'm open to anything. There's the three three with haste, and when it hits the opponent, you can choose to uh, every both players draw a discard or draw and take a damage. Both players discard. I thought about playing Raven Man if you were going to play more removal. It makes a one one flying Raven, although they can't block. Oh, that's interesting. We had a question about that in our mailbag segment, Raven Man. So, do you see some potential for the Raven Man? Like, how much do you need to enable it? I think Raven Man plus Ledger Shredder should at least be explored. I think that's really powerful. And like I said, I've been playing Riel with Ledger Shredder, and it's really awesome. No one else is doing this. And I've just missed five O's twice now. Um, and it's just really good. Like, you're already playing Ledger Shredder. This card has proven itself. And you just have these ancillary discards. Like, you play Ledger Shredder on two. You play Raven Man on another card. So you get to loot, make your Shredder a 2-4, hopefully. And then you get a 1-1 one, one Flyer. So maybe you have to rebuild it where you're playing like Liliana and Raven Man and you're not playing Kite Self Rebooter anymore. You're playing like the full four Thoughtseize. But I'd be up for that. Like, I'm a Raven Man believer. You can, you can play two Raven Man with Ledger Shredder 100% guaranteed. All right, here's a black flying creature. I Twitch. <laughs> okay. Paul gives right. you a discount on your, on your lesson. So you can cast environmental sciences for just one mana. I only don't hate that because we don't have any way to sacrifice it. But if you imagine it's going to die eventually, um, I don't. I don't hate that. I will say, because the gin does make the package in your sideboard interesting. Rafine. I mean, if you're going to go three colors, you can do Rafine with Raven Man and Ledger Shredder. I thought about that. So you know, I had that Rafine list that I love. Again, I think those lists would be fine. I wouldn't play Haughty Jin in them, though. I don't think Rafine is good in decks with counter spells. Hmm. All right. Those are just my... <laughs> the pickings are slim. It's true. Not a lot of black flyers. I think Raven Man is the most interesting card because it, it's not a flyer per se, but it's a hidden flyer. All right. I'm going to ponder that. <laughs> we will ponder the Raven Man. I have my eye on you, Kite Sailor Freebooter. This is tryouts for you. Yeah, if you're not a Kite Sail Freebooter, I mean, that's fine. There's, you know, nobody feels bad about that. <laughs> <laughs> so the spell package remains similar to the Is It version. I mean, in a sense, all the blue spells are the same. It's just tweaking it out which disruption interaction you want. Yeah, so basically black plays way better removal uh, against aggro in exchange for having way less endgame against uh, like other mid-range lists. Yeah, that makes sense. What else for the Haughty Jin? Any other shells you have your eye on? I mean, I don't think Haughty Jin works that well with the other 
cards. The one thing I would say is maybe you could splash it with white. Um, because white does have some interesting spells. You know, the white XXL spell, it has the one white destroy target creature or planeswalker, and um the opponent gets to investigate. Mm -hmm. And then white blue obviously plays well with counter spells. The problem is okay, what are your white flying creatures? A card I was thinking about was maybe Sarah Paragon because it lets you buy back your gin on the following turn. Like, okay, that's something. There are like, there's a white flash dragon that we laughed at and then someone 5 0 with. It's like a spirit dragon for a three and a white. I mean, maybe the answer is we're just supposed to play more blue flying creatures. Like, what about Spectral Sailor? What about a mono blue deck? Yeah, I mean. Do you think Spectral Sailor is good if it's if it, there's no spirit synergies? Like, do you th just think it's a playable card? No, but sometimes, sometimes you're trying to do something else, like stick a Curious Obsession on it or resolve winged words, and it just needs to be that one one flyer. You know, if Phoenix Chick were in mono blue, I would play that instead. Oh yeah! Oh, are you kidding me? But we don't, so we're gonna play the Spectral Sailor instead. The, the other thing I was kind of interested in is if you could make like a green blue list with a bunch of like pump spells and you play the, the two mana, two one flyer that like copy spells that target another flying creature. Or that, that target another creature. It's, it's the new card in the set. Uh, yeah, Ivy, the spell thief. Ivy, yeah. That's kind of interesting. And then you could maybe play like, I, I don't know what your spells would be. I don't even know if they'd like actually be reduced by the gin, but yeah, it's interesting. I was thinking like the growth spiral with kicker journey of something. Yeah. And you could play night pack ambusher. If you wanted, you could play like a blue green flashish kind of deck. I don't know if you want to play the gin there, but I think you would get cost reduction on a lot of your spells. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, like you say, the, the dream would be to just play a deck that's playing all two mana spells. And then you, if you always have the gin in play, your deck is way overpowered, but I just feel like you have to make a lot of uh, adjustments to the fact that you don't always have your gin in play. And so you don't want to be overloaded with two mana spells. If you're playing a bunch of one mana spells, then that starts to like narrow your decision tree as to what's good, right? We know one mana instants and sorceries are good with thing in the ice. We know one mana instants and sorceries are good with, you know, a more restrictive set of cards, ledger shredder, um, the, the drag sprite dragon, et cetera, et cetera. I'm somewhat surprised that your lists do not have sensor in them. I feel like usually I can't get you to, to stop playing sensor, but this week well, I'm actually thinking. I have a thinking... disruption. I have a Jwari <laughs> disruption in the red, in the black, <laughs> blue list, and I have uh, a sensor in my updated. Uh, is it looting list? I have my picture here uh, where I took out some sprite dragons and stuff. <laughs> so I did sneak <laughs> one of similar effects in here. But isn't that the perfect card for the naughty Jin? Like. Sorry, Haughty Jin. In my head, it's Naughty Jin. I think that's a better name. It was fun to teach Mort a new word. He didn't know what Haughty meant, uh, you know. Yeah, Haughty is also good, but, like, what if it was just called Naughty Jin? I'm in. Much better card. I'm even more in than but, I was before. Anyway, the, the Jin, perfect with sensor, right? Because even if you just cycle the sensor, you're still growing the Jin. But it, it gives you that maximum reduction effect. Now you get to play literal mana tithe, an overpowered card. Yeah, I mean, I think the reality, though, is like Lofty Denial is taking the place of the... I'm, I'm, I like playing four two-mana counterspells, and Lofty Denial is so good with this gin that it actually is just good, like, in the late game. Like, the problem is Sensor's not very good against Mono Green. That's the biggest problem. And it starts becoming kind of mediocre even against Red Black once the treasures start to flow, right? Like, it's very good on turn two and three, and then after that, it's really a struggle. Um, Lofty Denial is always good. It's just straight up counter spell against red black. They never have extra mana, right? It's and it's one blue, just counter any spell. It's just insane. So yeah, maybe sensor is better than I think, which is saying something because I'm almost the biggest sensor fan. I do. I did win the the war on blue white. They were all moving to Urian. No one was playing sensor, and then it's like they all started to lose, and then they all had to start playing four sensor again, which I always said they had to, and abandon Urian. And here we are. You're welcome, <laughs> blue white people. I was seven months ahead of the best players in the world. They had no idea what they're talking about. They came back to home the chickens came home to roost all right four sensor it's going in let's do it oh god four sensor four lofty denial <laughs> so if i test a naughty gin deck 
a Hodge index. Jeez. If I test a Hodge index, I think I want to try the divide by zero plan. Now, I don't have a firm direction. I don't have a North Star guiding me, but there are a good 20 or so decks that have 5-0'd with four divide by zero, and then your spell package, or rather your lesson package is just pretty basic. It's one environmental sciences, one teachings of the archaics, one mascot exhibition, nothing fancy at all. Like there's, there's no tricks here. You're just getting value off divide by zero and that's good enough. And that has been good enough without any kind of cost reduction or anything. It's just like we're playing divide by zero. These decks are not even playing Lear all the time. What if like that's actually just like a powerful shell to explore? So I kind of just want to try something like that. I will probably start with something that uses Crackling Drake and Kazula's Fury as like my finisher. Um, but maybe I'll I'll just put Audigen into the slot that used to go to like Thing of the Ice. Yeah, I I think that's actually very reasonable. The reason I haven't liked that package in the past is because it is so clunky. Three mana conditional counter spell is wildly unplayable in the format, but it is a lot more interesting if it's two mana conditional counter spell and it draws a card that only costs two mana to maybe draw two. And it's not just Counterspell. I mean, it bounces that goblin token. Bounces some other thing. <laughs> well, and especially because the the, mo the reason I'm most attracted to it is the fail case is paying three, but I don't mind doing that because I just described that I want to play Haughty Jin on four or Crackling Drake on four. Mm -hmm. That means I have a whole spot on three that I don't mind. If, I, if I'm not Ledger Shredder considering or leaving up Lofty Denial, I have an actual slot in my natural curve you know, you hear me talk about turn one, turn two, turn three, turn four a lot. This fits naturally into what I want to do. Like turn three, leave mana up if I don't want to play Haughty Jin in removal, counter your spell, draw my lesson, play Haughty Jin, cast the, my free spell, gain two life, get a basic land if if, if I want, or leave up Lofty Nile, Wind Words, etc. Like that just feels like a very natural curve. So I'm I'm not oppo as opposed to it as I normally am. Uh, as you know, I'm a, a little reticent to play these super clunky cards that are eventually good. That package is very good against Red Black, which you uh, seem to have problems with. So maybe that's what you you need to go way bigger. Perhaps I do. And you can just imagine the slots, right? Sprite Dragon isn't very good. Cut those two. You don't like Sensor. That's already three of your four slots. You find, you know, cut one more thing, replace your uh, Spike Field Hazard with a Kazul's Fury. Maybe like cut a Winged Words for your fourth um, card that uh, learns, and you you've kind of got like a shell right there. All right, so those are some ideas for the Hardy Jin. We will put them to the test this week and report back on our findings next time. Speaking of which, we do have some follow-ups to do on decks we've played. We're going to be sticking with Pioneer. I, I don't think there's much potential for the Hardy Jin in Modern. You would agree on that, right? <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. I don't think so either. Just due diligence. want to make sure we say that out loud. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so... Pioneer for the Hardy Jin, and it turns out the decks we tested this week were also in Pioneer. David, uh, why don't we start with you? So a few weeks back, we identified Soul of Windgrace as a card that looked like it should be good enough, right? And actually around that time, people were starting to put it into more of their lists. Seemed to be succeeding, you know, in some, in some measure, right? I, I played probably three different Soul of Windgrace decks, we talked about them a couple weeks ago. David... I tried one of your two lists in Pioneer. I tried the one with Fires of Invention and Shigeki Jukai Visionary, but I did not get the chance to try your second concept. Yeah, so the second concept was thinking like, we want to mill some number of cards anyway, because we want, it's really hard to turn on Soul of Wind Grace on turn four, right? So we're not ramping to it. You can't play a turn two accelerator that plays it on turn three, because there's nothing in your graveyard. It's just a five, four, no text that dies to Fatal Push. So I was like, if we're going to play Fable, probably we're going to play Blood Tithe Harvester. We're going to play Old Rutstein. Okay, we've got these cards that are helping fill our graveyard. They're also like sort of helping us ramp in the, in the case of Fable and, and Old Rutstein. So Old Windgrace also uh, described by you as a mini Titan, right? Mm -hmm. Card that comes into play can ramp and then let's say it hits a Fable Passage. When it attacks, it can ramp again. That process just naturally takes you to seven. So I proposed a list that had... Uh, three Cruelty of Gix, four Titan of Industry uh, at the top end. And so the thought was, if we happen to mill stuff, you know, with our Fable, we can discard it. And then it naturally leads us to five mana on turn four. If we get to attack with our 2-2, uh, we just cast Cruelty and we get a Titan, right? That's 
an under cost of Titan is very powerful. And even Soul of Windgrace is a card that might be in our graveyard and uh, Cruelty of Gix can find. Or Cruelty of Gix in the late game can tutor up Titan, right, with a second mode and then cast Titan on the following turn. I'm fascinated by Cruelty of Gix. I would love to know if this card met your expectations. It looks so powerful, but I haven't seen anyone using it. Yeah, so this was the classic. Like, it felt like I kind of got to do my thing in every game, and then I ended up just somehow losing, like, close game after close game. Um, the Titans were very clunky. I even, like, lost to Red Black, which, which I would think, like, I'm playing way bigger cards, right? We're both playing for Fable. I'm playing for um, Soul of Windgrace, right? They don't have four drops like that that can ramp. Cruelty of Gix is a full-on two-for-one. A Resolve Titan is a huge problem for them. But, I don't know, it just never worked out. I, I also did not get to... I didn't draw Soul of Windgrace very much, which felt frustrating. So, the league, I think I went 2-3. Beat Abzan, Grease Fang, lost to Red Black. I think 1-2 was close. Got beat by, like, Mono White, like, aggro lists. Uh, got, got on top of me before I could stabilize. So then I thought like maybe the list was too clunky. So I added two Graveyard Trespasser. I cut some Titans and just thinking like maybe I'll just tutor for the Titan with Cruelty. Uh, and then I can loot it away if it's in my hand or like cast it the following turn. And then played another league and had almost identical results again. So I'm not really sure what I learned. I learned that Soul of Windgrace is really not hard to provide value on turn four. The third color was very, very real. Like trying to cast Blood Tithe Harvester and then always make sure you had green on turn four while you're also like milling was not trivial. Um, the top end being Titan that needs three green was actually a problem. Cruelty of Gix was sometimes super sweet, sometimes it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, the whole deck just felt a little clunkier than maybe than it should have. And uh, I don't know if it's fixable. Maybe Maybe I just don't have the right cards in here. The theory just makes a lot of sense to me, but the main problem I think was I resolved Soul of Windgrace multiple times and just like ramping, putting another land into play just doesn't do very much. It does not, certainly does not draw a card. It's much worse than that. That matches, broadly speaking, our findings uh, when we tested this a couple of weeks back. Specific questions. How often did you activate Soul of Windgrace's abilities like discarding lands? And like on average, how many lands did you have on your hand available for that? like when Soul of Windgrace resolved? Typically, I didn't get very... I think I only activated it like two times in the whole... in two full leagues. Okay, that, that matches my experience too. So I normally just ramped. Sometimes I would attack again and ramp, and then, you know, whatever, block and trade. I mean, it was a fun... You know, like four mana, five, four creature that ramps isn't the end of the world. But I often didn't have a land... I mean, I probably drew a card with a land twice and gained life once or something. So I often didn't have lands left. Again, I didn't draw that much in the first league. That's just, I mean, there's three cards in a 70-card deck that sees a lot of cards between Fable, um, Blood, and, like, Milling. And it would have been awesome. Like, I wanted to draw it early, to be fair, so that's always a good time for the card. Like, against Red Black, I would have loved to have drawn it, but... And then, yeah, if you don't have any lands in your hand and mana up, that's the other thing. It doesn't do anything. <laughs> like, okay, you get an extra land in play. And I had some sweet lands. I hit my like opponent's muta vaults and things like that. And I think that the difference in modern is you don't have to do any extra work to put lands in your graveyard, and you um, can get back uh, Saga. Like you can get back a land that can kind of win, not win, but create a board presence on its own. Yeah, I mean that's a huge difference. So my second question was specifically Fabled Passage and the basic lands. So when I tested your other build with the Fires of Invention, I had so many problems with Fable Passage. It just weakened the mana base so much to have all these single producing lands, right? Like more than half the mana base only produced one color in a three color deck. I felt like it was necessary, but then that same week, uh, Claudio had 5 0 with his Soul of Grace Jun deck and he did not play any Fable Passage. He played two or three basics to support Traverse the Ulvenwald, but he relied on just Fable the Mirror Breaker, just Setter Wayfinder, Incidental Discard, a little bit of self-mill. I feel like maybe that's the way to go. Just like don't mess up your mana too much. You know, give yourself more slots for dual lands, more slots for, you know, all four Proving Grounds. Yeah, I mean, 
my proposed update would be to try a Fable Passage list with Tracker just to like try to go all in on like super value and just abandon the like Titan cruelty thing. But I don't think that's very good either. And I think the problem is there's just four drops that do as much or more than Soul in more matchups. I'm going to say specifically Shieldred, specifically Kalidus. And they don't bend your mana at all. You don't have to do any of that. You just get to play red, black, or black, blue, or black, green. Uh, like, you know, you see a lot of people just win with black, green. And your mana is perfect, and you get to do all this extra stuff, and you don't have to play red or whatever. Whichever color you think is weak. You don't have to play green, or you don't have to play... Well, you have to play... You should play black. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, that was a problem to me, is we're not... It's not... This is not a better card intrinsically than Shieldred. This is not a better card intrinsically than Kalidus. This is not a better card intrinsically than uh, Chandra. Hmm. This is not a better card intrinsically than Asika's Chariot, I don't believe. So we're doing a lot of extra work to play this card, and it's worse, I think, than some of those options on four. Okay, well, that's important, important findings. So Soul of Wingrace, maybe not the card for Pioneer yet, but for Modern, you know, it seems to be picking up speed. Uh, if not in the Urza Saga deck, I mean, I think more and more people are finding success with just, like, Pretty basic Valakut shells. They're just using it as extra copies of Primeval Titan, extra copies of Omnath, and they're playing a lot of copies of Wish for Scapeshift. And that's the whole plan. Yeah, and that makes sense to me. If if all you need is an intrinsic number of lands in play, okay, like if we could come up with a Scapeshift list, if you could tell me what that list would look like in Pioneer, then I think this card would be interesting. The other thing is... Red and six is a huge card, right? I'm guessing every deck that plays Solo Wind Grace is playing Red and six. You just always have these lands. You have all these lands in your hand. So if you ever untap with it, it gets to like draw three or you know whatever, some crazy, and protect itself. Or you never get to do that here. There's you don't have extra lands laying around. You're playing a land every turn. Yeah, like your opponent has a Liliana. Like okay, I mean we don't have any lands. I'm just <laughs> playing a five four that ramps. So then it's like honestly kind of like a bad again solemn simulacrum because <laughs> at least solemn always draws a card when it dies well i think that we all saw something different when we looked at the card but we were probably thinking of different different formats there's truth to all of these evaluations i was surprised by how hard it was to just straight up ramp to titan i thought that would be a thing that happened a lot more often and the problem is if you play four titans you end up with really clunky opening hands and the four Titan three Gix just leads to lots of clunky opening hands. Like Gix is only good on turn five if you already have a good creature in your graveyard, right? So, and Solar Wind Grace puts a land into play tapped, which it, you know it says that yes. on the card, but like in your mind, you're so excited for this extra land you're about to get, and then you have to wait a turn to do the thing. Yep. <laughs> so. yep. Anyway, yeah, I think it just it doesn't have a home in Pioneer because it doesn't have. Ran six, it doesn't have Saga, it doesn't have Valka, it doesn't have Scape Shift. Those are all cards that just want the the land that you're putting in play is actually worth a card as opposed to just a random extra mana source. All right. One last deck to talk about, and this is following up on last week's card. Mord and myself were looking at the card Telerian Terror. Six in a blue, creature, serpent, five five, with ward two. Telerian Terror costs one less to cast for each instant and sorcery card in your graveyard. So, echoes of Gurmag Angler, echoes of Murktide Regent. We just thought this was a nice temple play, basically. Mord was playing it in Pauper, in like this deck that played four Telerian Terrors and four Gurmag Anglers. That deck had a great weekend. I mean, it got first and second in the Pauper Challenge after we recorded that show. So this is, seems to be like a top tier deck in Pauper. Does that translate to the higher powered formats? Well, I don't know if you consider Pioneer a higher power format than Pauper or not. But <laughs> I don't think I do. It'd be interesting to run, run the decks against each other. <laughs> Does it translate to modern? Well, we didn't test modern. Okay, so it is, <laughs> I tested Pioneer. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if Pioneer is more powerful than Pauper or not. Probably not. All right, open question to our Discord. <laughs> Dan's going to post a poll. All right, so I'm going to take my best Pioneer Telerian Terror deck against your best yeah, exactly. Pauper Telerian Terror deck. Who wins? That's going to be a slaughter. Don't they get to play Brainstorm? Oh, yes. <laughs> it's guy's got to be Pauper by a mile, right? <laughs> they get uh, Thought Scour, Mental Note, Brainstorm. Yeah, we're playing Ops out <laughs> here. That's game. <game. laughs> 
Um, but yeah, I mean, there's no go blanks in, in Pulper, so it's a different, it's a whole different thing. Yes. Anyway, the deck I decided to test was actually not one that we designed, but this popped up on the five O's this week, and it just looked like the quintessential Faithless Brewing deck. Demir Midrange. Just a pile of mid-range stuff. A whole bunch of graveyard trespassers, full four main deck. You know, Moore was angry that someone was playing one on the sideboard. Okay, instead of one on the sideboard, let's play all four trespassers main deck. All four yep. Tularian Terrors main deck. Sure. And just assume that wins the game. Now, there's more stuff here, right? There's also some Planeswalkers. There's three Lily of the Veil, two Lily Last Hope. One Tenacious Underdog, a couple Creature Lands, and then a bunch of miscellaneous spells. Thought Seize, Push, Consider, Opt, four Sensors. Uh, you know this is a Faithless Brewing deck. It's got four Sensors in it. <laughs> two Dig Through Times, two Saw It Coming, which I don't really like that card, but I hadn't actually tried it before. It was interesting. Thumbs down on Saw It Coming. Do not play this card. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the one thing that... Especially in a list like this. What, are you tapping out on turn two to freaking put it in exile? That's not how we play this game. Well, you're not doing anything else on turn two. And it was actually kind of cute. <laughs> That's that, a choice. <laughs> uh, true. It, it was kind of cute that you can foretell the saw it coming and then play Lily of the Veil and have everyone discard their hands. But, you know, I don't think it's... Yeah, that's not a real plan. That's just something this deck can do. Yeah, I... Okay. Yep. So the pilot... Uh, I don't know how to pronounce this. Chui Bifeng? Chui Bifeng. Urbian Chui Bifeng. Exactly. Congratulations to them. If we get it wrong, our apologies. Congratulations to them on their sweet 5-0. I decided to just run this exact list, no changes. Because, I mean, this is exactly what I want to know. Like, can Telerian Terror by itself, you know, with a proper spell count like we have here, you know, just, just do enough. There's no secret plans. It's just like, I'm going to interact. I'm going to destroy your creatures. I'm going to eventually seize the advantage with a 5-5 five, five ward 2 or a 3-3 three, three ward discard a card. Yeah, ward. Nice ability. Okay, and uh, how did she, uh, how'd she treat you? Uh, pretty bad. Pretty bad. <laughs> so I went 1-4. and four. Lost twice to Rakdos Sacrifice, once to Lotus Field, once to a Tarka Red. Beat an Elves deck. The thing is, when you're playing against a Demir deck in Pioneer, you'll have this feeling where like, oh, you, you draw a card, you cast it, and then you think about like, wait a second, they're Demir. They can't possibly interact with my card. And you feel great about yourself and you win the game. You win the whole match. Because <laughs> Demir is like really, really limited in what it can do. Are we talking about cards such as Witch's Oven? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I mean, even the Elves player brought in a Shaper Sanctuary and almost won the game with that. Just anything like that is a disaster. I mean, the Lotus Field deck, I had no relevant interaction against them. Even the Atarka Red deck, like, okay, I have creature removal. I, I should be on the right track, right? But they're just, like, too fast. There's, there's a little too much clunk here. Like, I have a screenshot where, you know, I, I resolve Shaeldred on turn four. I'm at nine life. I'm going to turn the ties now, right? Shaeldred is the burn killer. They can't attack through it. It has five toughness. What does the opponent do? Well, they go like one drop, one drop, bushwhacker, attack for 15. I'm like, okay. <laughs> All right. Good match, good match. So just felt like the other decks were operating at like a slightly higher degree of efficiency. Like they were more committed to it. And I felt like my deck was not all in on his plan like i really wanted the terror to be awesome every time i drew it but it was only awesome about half the time the other half the time it, it was just like a little bit more expensive than i needed it to be like i needed it to cost one but it cost three or i needed it to cost two but it cost four so there was just like not enough spells here you're playing 24 spells i mean it sounds like a lot but yeah, it's, that's, I agree, though. That's not that many. If you don't start on opt and consider, your graveyard is not going to be that full. And if your opponent at any point casts go blank against you, or their own graveyard trespasser, or claim the firstborns your graveyard trespasser, which happened multiple times, you're just like a long way away. Well, at least they had to discard a card. At least they had to discard a yeah, card. They discarded a second culture familiar for their second, which, which is open. <laughs> 
Really? <laughs> Were they able to generate a treasure or a uh, food by sacrificing your graveyard trespasser, which perhaps had four toughness? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. They performed village rites. They settled their daily <laughs> disputes. It was an interesting time for them. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Obviously, the deck is better than I... It's better than it looked when I was playing it, because it did 5-0. It felt a little rough around the edges to me. Like, the mana was a lot worse than I expected it to be. 22 lands, two of them Field of Ruin. I got screwed by Field of Ruin so many times. God, I hated drawing that card. I'm really surprised. So two Field of Ruin, four Fabled Passage, but only four basics to get. I typically play one more basic than I have Fabled Passage, and I don't play any fields. So I think that's really ambitious. You can run out of basics, like, very trivially here. <laughs> that happened multiple games I ran out of basics. Yeah. And Field of Ruin is not good. Like, you just, you need it to keep pace with, like, the other decks, but it's not, you don't want to have this in here. What about, I kind of like the idea, though, that Liliana of the Last Hope can minus two, put extra, like, spells in your graveyard, and then, like, get back a Terror and play it for cheap. Did that ever happen? This is a total, um, this is a total Faithless Brewing deck, though. Four Sensor, four Graveyard Trespasser. <laughs> Four of our card of the week, with it happened to be Talarian Terror, so this, you know, mm -hmm. person uh, <laughs> fell right into our trap. And then three Siphon Insight in the sideboard, probably, quote, for the grindy matchup. Like, what the hell is that? That's a classic meme move. I love that. that that's, what, that's what sold me on the deck. What's that even good against? What are you playing Siphon Insight against? Because I've been crying out to play these cards. Is that just like your control matchup? You just, like, try to two for one? Like, that's your think twice? I think so. I think so. I mean, there's no mystical dispute here. <laughs> I brought it in against Lotus Field because I did not have any mystical disputes to bring in, so I brought in Siphon Insight instead. How did that go? <laughs> I stole their mystical dispute, and I still lost O2. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of like some of the, I kind of like the build of this deck. I'm not surprised they 5 0 Um, But yeah, if you, if you let me fix the mana and tool around with some of the choices, I, I, it feels like there's something there. Did it feel like it was there's occasional like runs where you're doing cool powerful stuff like how did terror feel when you cast it the times i felt powerful were when i cast like two terrors on turn four that happened twice mm. graveyard trespasser is fair it's good but it's fair so you, you really need to have some card that feels like oh, i'm cheating when i resolve this and Talerian terror can be that card this deck was not committed to it enough like i almost want to go full pauper and do like four terror four gurmag angler a lot more self mill and just like more spells. Like it needs expressive iteration, that kind of card. Yeah, I, I will say like this list is not identical to, but it is similar to, you know, when I was playing that uh, Saltai list that had uh, four Tassiger. Okay. And it was playing the 3-3 the three, three that mills. And if it mills a creature, you get a 2-2 two, two zombie. Oh, it's the DC. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the DC list. So, you know, I think I 4-1, and then I played it again, of, of course, after I was saying, oh, this deck is actually pretty playable. I think I like 05 or something. <laughs> I felt so bad. I recommended it to our, hopefully our Discord just ignored me as a psycho and never did it. But the thing that kept happening is I would resolve Tassiger, like super efficient, you know, one mana play on turn three or whatever, and I'd cast, uh, whatever, Abrupt Decay. And then my opponent just would not give a shit about a 4-5 or five for one mana. They just did not care at all. And I think that's the problem I would have with Terror. I, that's what I'm most curious about. Is like, is a one mana 5-5 five, five on turn four that leaves some mana up? Is that actually that good? That, that's the question to be asking. Well, one is not enough. I mean, you need, you need multiple in play to have a serious clock. It was not significantly better than the games where I just like, happened to draw the one Tenacious Underdog on turn two. Like, it was functionally the same. Like, drawing the underdog, playing it on turn two, and then, you know, having a, something in play while leaving my, my men up every turn. Mm. It felt the same. Yeah, I mean, my instinct would be to play the one three that loots when you cast your second spell and just, like, cut the digs, cut some of the Liliana-type stuff. You don't really need the Trespasser. Just try to win with those guys. Like, let's get serious here. Yeah, I mean, this deck was heavy on threes. We could definitely get a lot leaner. A lot leaner. So, uh, those are just some very preliminary results with Tolerian Terror in the weakest format, Pioneer. <laughs> Weaker even than Pauper. <laughs> that settles it. <laughs> it's clearly worse, but I still think it's an interesting card, and I'm going to keep tinkering with it. Have people been trying it all in Modern? 
Has has anyone five owed with it? Yeah, the um the Grixis Death Shadow deck that no longer has Death Shadow because it is playing Telerian Terror instead. Uh, we talked about that last week. Um, the okay. same list, different pilot, but the same list uh, was in the five O's again this week. It's five O at least four times on the four deck dumps. Interesting. One player did also five O with Telerian Terror in an Is It Prowess deck, just as a one of. How many spells are they playing in Is It Prowess? Or in or in the uh, Shadowless Shadow? They're playing Grixis, so they're they're playing Expressive Iteration, right? Yeah, it's basically Grixis Death Shadow. So it's two Croxas, four Ledger Shredders, four Ragavans, four Dragon's Rage Channeler, three Telerian Terror, four Mitchell's Bobble, and everything else is a spell. I don't know if we can do the math in our heads. That's probably 20 spells. Okay. Huh. But yeah, it's because of Expressive Iteration that you're you're never out of gas. And of course, you know, Bobble and Ledger Shredder, you're, you're always flushing things to do. I think that blue black deck should start playing Drawing the Lock and Pioneer again. That's like one of my hotter takes, especially if you're going to play four Thoughtsies and all this removal. I think Drown and the Lock is like a one or two of. Like Phoenix is not everywhere. You're not going to play against it very often. And red black, it's just going to turn into Counterspell slash Terminate. It's going to be really good against them. Mm, eventually. No, like on turn, on turn three, it's going to be Counterspell Terminate. What? No. How many cards do you think they have in their graveyard on turn three? Three? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, they've resolved Fable, your, uh, your favorite card. They've discarded a card or two. They've cast Thoughtseize or whatever. You... Yeah, that's like turn six, right? Oh, we're not getting to turn six. I'm resolving multiple Telerian Terrors and just going to town on them. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to try it. So I think we can definitely go back to the drawing board with this deck. I like the basic shell of this list, except for I hate the mana base and I hate saw it coming and dig through time. And if we can monkey around from there, then I think we might have something. All right. I accept the challenge. Yes. All right. We'll leave it there for now. Um, got a bunch of projects ongoing, so we'll be checking in on these cards uh, as we get more results coming in. Until next week, we will have to see what... A little gin can say about this uh, crazy old pioneer world. <laughs> that naughty, haughty gin. <laughs> that naughty, naughty gin. <laughs> All right, take care, David. All right, take care. Deck lists for this episode can be found at our homepage, faithlessbrewing.com. And tune in next time for our testing results, plus a look at modern after Yorian. Support for this podcast is provided by brewers like you. Join the Faithless family and help support the show at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing for Discord access, bonus content, and more. That's all for today. Stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Bye.